What's up guys? We're back. And Casey has officially named our car blocks. Do you already forget? I already forgot. <laughs> okay, so you know there's fireside chats. He called it rumble strip chats. Rumble oh, strip. Yeah. Like, How about rumble strip ramblings? <laughs> That's what I'm gonna call it. Rumble rumble strip ramblings. That's not a tongue twister Maybe at we all. We can like put the audio of the rumble strip in. I don't know how you would capture that. It might have. It might have caught it. I can't tell, and I'm not gonna stop no, this. It's video really just windy to see. on this drive. So. I apologize too. We're in my car this time, and I love my vehicle, but Casey does not. And one of the things that he does not love about it is that my car is very loud. So the audio on this video is going to be negative Ghost Rider, but that's we're what doing the car it. rides are all about. That's what Rumble Strip Rumble Strip Rambles. I'm not gonna be able to say that. I might have to just call it RRs. Okay, we are trying to get through all of your guys' questions one at a time, which is difficult because there are probably 10 to 15 questions per day that we receive. We get questions on Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Uh, YouTube. YouTube. Lots so like of questions trying to like on YouTube. grab some from every spot. And try to find the like common denominator questions and attack those. Um, one of the things that I have noticed recently is I feel like people ask questions and then I basically just have to say, hey, refer back to this video. We literally talk about that exact thing. So I understand if you're a new viewer, if you have a question, you're like, oh, I want to ask. But um, I would encourage you to go back and watch a lot of our old videos because we do talk about like 90% of the questions we receive. We've already done a video on. I'm not saying we won't do more videos on that just because. Oh, yeah. We're going to keep talking about it. Yeah, there's only so much I feel like we could talk about with coffee, unfortunately, and so we just have to keep kind of repeating information and maybe wording it differently or capturing different audiences at different times that haven't heard the information. So for some of you, we may repeat things, and for others, it may be the first time, and you're like, wow, this is exactly what I needed in this time. So um, that being said, I feel like one of the questions we hear a lot is how do you choose a coffee roaster, and then how do you come up with the drinks that you're going to serve at your coffee shop? Yeah, the roaster <laughs> one. Um, a lot of a lot of the things, a lot of people really overthink, like the roaster. Um, roasters want your business; they want to sell you their coffee. So, in the same way that customers want to come get your coffee, because you are the business offering the product, you are literally the roasters are begging for your business. I mean, not like desperately begging for your business, but it's way easier like just like it's so simple like, yeah roasters reach out to us i don't know sometimes we get a couple of weeks sometimes you know sometimes it's a dry spell for a little definitely bit definitely monthly though we have roasters reaching out to us all the time they send us samples trying yeah. to get us to try their coffee and serve their coffee yeah. so that is like literally one of the easiest things i feel like i get to tell people because they're like how do i find a roaster i'm like oh my goodness there are tons of roasters um you also have the option to roast yourselves and that's a question that people have asked us is like have you guys started roasting yourselves or is that something you guys want to do um at this time we love the roaster that we're partnering with we really love the quality of their coffee and everything about them so we have been very content in our purchase decision to use them as our roaster however um we all never know what the future is going to hold for us and so there might be a day where we do start dabbling into roasting our own coffee um, however, there are no plans for that at this moment. Um, for some of you, that might be something that you consider. In fact, I've actually talked to a few mentees who they currently roast and they want to dabble into opening their own shop. So they're actually going opposite. They started with roasting and now they want to open their own coffee shop where we started with a coffee <laughs> shop and had a roaster um, and then maybe someday would venture into roasting our own coffee. Yeah, never, we'll never say never. Yeah. It's a lot of work, um, so we have to calculate not only the cost to buy the roaster, ro the roaster that we would need would probably be around forty to $50,000. Um, there's a software that you can use while roasting. I know absolutely nothing about it. We haven't even started the process of even looking at it just because it hasn't been our focus. Yeah, like our focus is growth, and it's hard to grow with more locations when when you're putting all your focus into roasting because I think when you do roast I mean I don't know we have, we'd have to take classes we'd have to go kind of do what you guys are doing we'd have to go on YouTube 
yeah. and probably try to find someone to teach us how to do it. I know that they do classes on it. Um, I don't know. It's a whole process, but yeah. that's not something you guys have to look into right now. That's not something we looked into. We literally yeah. just started out straight with, we need a roaster and we started doing our research. So And we went there and got to do a bunch of taste testing. Which was so fun, yeah. Here's what I'm so gonna if they say. Don't do that, I wouldn't go with them. I wouldn't either. Because that's like you wanna be able you to You wanna know. try it and you wanna get to know yeah. them too. So okay, here's probably my best tips in no particular order. So don't just read through it all. Write these down though maybe. Um Google, straight up. Start looking on Google and say coffee roasters near my location. Does it need to be local to you? Not at all. Um, however, you just need to consider that there's a potential that you're going to be paying for shipping with coffee. So you might, for cost wise, you might try to find someone local first that you really like um, and use a local roaster because then you can either pick it up like we do or um, they can deliver it to you. So maybe look into local ones first. But like we said, there's no reason that you have to use someone local. Uh, so find, just kind of Google, start Googling, look on Instagram, look on Facebook, find someone that you really like, set up a testing or see if they'll send you some of their products to test, which that's very traditional. They all will. Um, and I, we loved going to visit the roasters because we were planning on using someone local. That was important to us. Um, so it was nice to go in and have them prepare it and then also explain every roast and like why certain roasts taste the way that they do, the origin of the beans. Um, and roasters can teach you a lot too about like the preparation of espresso and uh, I don't know, all the different proper yeah, methods, what they want. Different kinds of decaf. Yeah. Um, there's uh, different, not just different roasts, there's different beans from different parts of the world. There's different quality of coffee beans. It's kind of like uh, like diamonds or anything like that. I mean, there there's different grades. So letting you know, having your roaster tell you what kind of what grade of coffee they use, where do they buy it from? Do you want to go organic? Do you want to go non-organic? What? Yeah, there's so many options, you guys, and the the options are pretty much endless when it comes to this. So you really can't go wrong. Um, you just want to find what's going to be best for your brand. Uh, now, something that I always talk to my mentees about it, when we're doing mentoring sessions is I say, you need to look at the costs and figure out if it's going to work for you. This is the thing. There are so many different types of coffee shops in the world. There are really fast, really convenient, maybe like McDonald's McCafe, right? They, the quality isn't going to be the same as a nice cafe. It's a quick, they, you get through, you get your coffee. It's cheap. It's on the cheaper side. Then I would say that there's coffee shops kind of like us where it's like the drive-through models um, where the quality is much better but it's not still quite the quality that you're going to get if you go into a really nice bougie cafe <laughs> which I love. Those are my favorite. Okay. Yeah it takes some like I don't know like their biggest size is probably a 12 ounce. Yes. They have like maybe three or four flavors and they're yes. like 100% natural. They probably make their flavors. Yes. And they, every they cup has latte art. Yes, your shots yeah. are weighed. Your espresso we is we weighed. Have like, we got like 10 cars on each side. Like. <laughs> Ours is a little bit more of the convenience side. However, oh, we still really care about quality. Yes. So, okay, keep that in mind when I tell you this. I know of coffee shops that are paying like $4 a pound for their coffee. Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> We know of coffee shops. That being said, I will share, because I have nothing to hide from it, that we pay $10 per pound for our coffee. Now you can tell in the difference between the $4 and the $10, the difference in quality of that coffee, okay? And then I've also heard from mentees who are buying even more expensive coffee, um, and they're paying like around $13 a pound. So I would say that the average range I have seen does go in between that like $4 and $13. It's up to you. And I think you can really tell the difference. Yes. And, well, I know you can tell the difference between a cheap coffee and like our coffee because ours is right up there toward the top of the quality. However, there's coffees out there that people are selling for $20 a pound. Yeah. And I don't think most people, in fact, I know most people would never know the difference. In fact, they may prefer the $10 pound coffee over the 20. And if you're a coffee shop like us with, you're adding 
tons of syrup and chocolate and all sorts of stuff to it, they really aren't going to know. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you get a bad quality because even though you have a mocha with chocolate and caramel and whatever else in it, you can still taste bad coffee. Yes. We've tasted it a thousand times. So this is the other thing too. Thing. I love sharing this because I feel like it makes sense. It's a good analogy for you guys. Imagine if you go to a store and you buy the cheapest quality steak and you buy the most expensive steak that you can find and then you prepare both of them wrong. Okay, like awful, right? Both of them, regardless if you bought the cheapest quality steak and the most expensive quality steak, are going to taste horrible because they weren't prepared correctly. Then you could buy like a medium grade steak and a really nice quality steak, okay? And then you prepare them very well both. At that point, yes, you might be able to still tell that like, wow, this is an excellent steak. But that one that was really like medium grade, it was not bad, it wasn't the best, but it was a good quality steak. It might taste amazing and your customers would be very pleased with that quality steak that they got from you. So coffee can be similar in the same way. Yes, you can buy the nicest coffee in the entire world, but if you're not preparing it correctly, it's not going to taste great. And if you buy kind of like a medium to high grade coffee and you prepare it very well, it could taste almost just as good as that really high quality coffee. And if we're being completely honest, most places we go to, they do not prepare the coffee correctly. Yes. Their espresso machine isn't set up correctly. They're pulling six second shots. They're not tamping properly. They're either putting too much or not enough espresso in the portafilter. And we, you know, we're constantly checking our quantities and checking our weights to make sure that, you know, not daily, but, you know, monthly, we're, we're keeping track to make sure our, our water volume in our espresso machine is, is correct. And uh, temperatures of steamed milk, steaming them up correctly. I mean, we, we, could, we could make you a drink at our coffee shop with the exact same ingredients, even at the exact same temperature of milk, and we could make them taste completely different. Yeah. Because we can really, oh, yeah. <laughs> we can really pull your shots way too long or not long enough. We could uh, put too much air in your milk when we're steaming it, uh, make it all bubbly, and we could burn your milk. I mean, there's so many things that that take into you know that go into account with quality. So I think just finding a good balance. I Absolutely, mean, and I think this is the thing too. Like a lot going. of people who come to us with questions just want the answer. They just want us to tell them like, choose this. But yeah. sometimes that's not always the answer because it's your coffee shop, it's your vision, it's your model, it's what quality you want to use, it's what type of coffee really fits your brand the best. If we all used exactly the same coffee or we all used exactly the same products, then what would the fun in that be? There would be no difference, there would be no reason to have all these different coffee shops if everything was exactly the same. So for a simple answer, all you have to do is just find roasters and reach out to them. And, and try a few. And try them, yeah. yeah. Don't be afraid to try a bunch of different ones because we tried, like we, ironically, the first one we tried was the one we chose. Um, and then we tried a few others just to see, you know, what, what else was out there. Um, but then we ended up going back to the first one we chose because we loved it. Um, something else to kind of consider, I guess, if you want to just like know some questions to ask of them, although roasters are full of knowledge and take advantage of it. It's wonderful. Most. Yeah, most. It's wonderful to learn from different people um, because we all don't know every single thing about it. And so um, one of the things that our roaster that we liked, one of the reasons we chose the one that we chose is that, um, by the way, we're his only customer at the moment, I believe. He sometimes uh, will service different churches, but basically he is a private roaster for <coughs> us, which is really cool. We love that. Um, one of the things that we were attracted to is that he roasts in very small batches, 50 pounds at a time. And what we loved about that was that every single batch is quality controlled because in a small batch, you are able to really pay attention and look closely at what is happening in the roasting process. Uh, like Casey said, there's some systems and, and computers like he showed us where you hit certain temperatures at certain times and there's times you have to do certain things and it's a, it's a process. Um, and you're trying to keep it consistent. Yes. Which coffee is like we have a like uh, your your typical like your blend that we that we go with always 
it slightly changes throughout the year because different coffees are in different seasons at different times. So you don't want to use just uh, like an El Salvador uh, single, origin. single origin for your primary roast because certain times of the year you won't be able to get it. Yes. So then you're going to be changing and then people are going to say, wow, your coffee tastes way different right now. Well, that's because we had to change it. So what we do yeah. is I think we have a blend of three. I think it's four actually. Three or four. Four different beans, um, and that's just like Casey's explaining. This is kind of like coffee knowledge, I guess. But it, it was cool when we learned it from our roaster. Is that most people you'll notice when you go to a, a coffee shop, and again, this is depending on the coffee shop. I have been to shops that have single origin espresso. Um, however, for us, and for a lot of coffee shops that are similar to us, we all use a espresso blend. And the reason for that, just like Casey said, is that coffee is just like any other fruit. It has seasons where it comes in season and out of seasons. Um, different countries. Yeah, in different possible. parts of the world. There are certain places in the world where they can grow coffee consistently year round, which is great, which is why you see a lot of Colombian coffee, for instance, um, because you know it's easier for them to grow it more consistently. However, um, like our espresso specifically, we know has four different beans in it. And that is because certain times of the year when one of those beans isn't available, our roaster will replace it with a, a similar but different bean so that our customers, regardless if they come to us in August or December, their coffee will taste the same. Now, when it comes to our drip coffee, which is, you know, like single, like a black coffee, for instance, or a pour over or a cold brew, anything like that, we do use single origin and we let our customers know that that one does change throughout the seasons. But they usually love that because it's kind of fun if you're a, a person who enjoys like the taste of coffee. Uh, an Americano, uh, we use our espresso for, but um, it's nice for them because they're like, ooh, I really love when your winter coffees come in. And then there's some of them that they don't like as much, but um, you, you don't have to do any of that. That's kind of where I guess it's hard for us at times to give advice because at the end of the day, you guys need to make a decision for what's going to be best for your shop. We can tell you what we do, but what we do isn't always, a, it's not a rule. You don't have to follow our rules to be successful. You need to follow what you think is going to be best in your area with your market. What is available to you? How much do you want to spend on your coffee? It's okay if you want to spend like the $4 on coffee. We know of several shops that do this, um, but that just wasn't the model that we wanted to go with. <laughs> um, so I don't know. You just have to use your best judgment for what you think is going to be best for your shop. Yeah. And don't buy flavored coffee beans. Yes. Don't buy flavored coffee beans. Like when you see, I Hazelnut see them on Facebook coffee. all the time, where they're like, yeah, they're like, I don't know, peppermint, but they like flavor the beans. Or you see them at, at grocery stores or at Walmart when you go look at the coffee, and they're flavored coffee beans. That means they are the cheapest beans in the world. They taste awful and they have to put flavors on them to make them it's drinkable. <laughs> yes. And we know. Do us shop. that favor. <laughs> There's a coffee shop that does that too. Yes. I'm like, do us that favor. I'm Don't like, do that. Oh, one. this is our drip coffee. It's a caramel drip coffee. I'm like, and you can buy the beans and they say caramel flavor. Yeah. Just get a good bean and then add caramel flavoring yeah. to it. Yeah. Don't buy flavor. Okay. Cool. All right. <laughs> so that was Roaster. Let's talk a little bit about menus. And I feel like this is going to be several videos. Um, oh, yeah. So we'll just kind of, talk. we'll just dabble a little and then we'll get deeper into it in other videos, but maybe this will open questions that you guys have. Um, menu is going to be very similar to Roaster. Just like I told you before, I'm going to keep saying this. There is no hard, fast rules. You are opening a shop to be different. However, there is also no need to reinvent the wheel um, unless you're Starbucks and you can just continuously make a drink and then change the name. Let's I don't just know tell you guys... them what we did. It was super simple, you guys. We drove around to probably 20 different coffee shops and In took our pictures. whole area, not just like our town, but yeah, like the we whole went. Northwest. Yeah, yeah. We drove, I mean, we spent months going to all these different coffee shops and we took pictures of their menus on our phone. And then we would go home and we would look at, oh wow, this menu is really confusing. Look how everything's just like hard to find. You'll notice when you look at our menus, everything's 
I feel like extremely easy to see like categorized, categorized. Yeah. Uh, the drinks we, we took pictures of a whole bunch so we were like yeah we don't think anyone's gonna want to buy that so we took the best of all these menus and we created our own including yeah. pricing because when you take a picture of their menu pretty much all of the coffee shops we go to sell a mocha and some of them only do a 12 and a 16 ounce some of them do 12, 16, 20, and 24. That's what we do. We do four four sizes. Uh, some of our competitors only do three sizes. I mean, in my mind, I was like, I don't understand why not offer a bigger size simply because all you have to do is buy a box of cups and now you have that size. It doesn't cost us really any more. And if someone wants to pay extra for a bigger size, why wouldn't we want that? So that's kind of my two cents on that. But but we li literally just looked at pricing of everyone else and we we didn't try to just undercut everyone but we definitely as a new coffee shop didn't our prices were definitely lower than theirs for on average yeah. because we or, didn't or the same or the same yeah like not Either much like lower like right maybe at, 10 cents lower at the, i think it was like five some cents, of them were like maybe. 5 cents yeah, yeah. because so this we is the, the thing the like most expensive. We didn't want you in the same way that you need to decide if your coffee shop is going to be a four dollar per pound espresso or a thirteen dollar per pound espresso you also need to say okay so if i'm paying four dollars a pound for espresso then i can afford to have cheaper prices right but then you're you might get kind of the reputation of the cheap coffee shop which people might love especially if you're in an area where that that niche is needed um, or if you're like, well, I'm paying $13 a pound for our espresso. It is organic. It is single origin. It is like really high quality. I'm going to use the highest quality syrups that I can get that have no uh, artificial food coloring. Um, I'm going to get only organic milk. We're going to have a beautiful cafe that we're going to invest a lot of money into the aesthetic of. Well, then, yeah, your prices are going to have to be higher or you're not going to make a profit. Right? And so that's the thing too that Casey's talking about is that different areas have different prices. For instance, um, we just visited Maui, Hawaii. The prices of coffee in Maui is crazy compared to the prices of coffee in Idaho. Yeah, like $4 drink in ours, 4 or $5 drink is 6, six. 7 Yeah. So it's... And so that is why it's important that you guys are doing market research in your area to see what your competitors are charging. I know it feels a little cringy. You're like, I'm supposed to go look at their prices, but everyone does this, you guys. It's part of doing your due diligence to open a company. Clothing companies look at what other people are charging for a plain white t-shirt. And then from there, they decide, well, listen, my competitors, everyone's charging you know, $20 for this t-shirt, but I'm going to use a higher quality material. I'm going to have a higher end brand. I want to sell to a specific market. So my price for a plain white t-shirt is going to be $40. And that's okay. If your market can sustain it and you believe that your brand can put off a $40 white t-shirt brand, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And so that's where people start to really overthink the menu and they start to think like, I don't know where to even come up with these prices. Well, what are your competitors charging for the same drink? Take an average. Yeah. Take your five favorite menus, find their small mocha, add up each five mochas and divide by five. And that's the average for your area that a small mocha is costing. I mean, definitely don't overthink it. You know, yes. go in and, and you get to you get to decide. You get to you. That's the cool part about starting your own business is you don't have to get. The no approval. one's telling you what you have to do for this, which can be a little terrifying. Don't get me wrong. I understand yeah. that. I understand that you're like, well, what if I'm messing this whole thing up? Um, but <laughs> you also can't really mess it up as long as you are just kind of using common sense and the fact that you're like, well, if all my competitors in the area are charging $3.50 for this drink, I'm going to charge nine. You better have some good reasons to back that up yeah. because your customers, while they might be understanding if it is a really specific, really unique, really cool product that no one else is offering, yeah, they might pay the $9. That's awesome. But if you provide the exact same product that your competitor is charging $3.50 for and you're nine and you're new in the market, it might be really tough to get customers to be willing to spend that. So yeah, you're already you're already at a disadvantage being a brand new company that has no brand recognition. If yeah. you come into the market for with a franchise, you have this name recognition. We aren't we aren't 
helping those types of people. We're helping people who are wanting to start from nothing. So no one knows who you are. The last thing you want, in my opinion, is to have the highest prices right out the door. Unless you have a really unique, yeah. really cool model and there's a reason you're justifying those really yep. high prices. Yep. And because it'll be harder for you. That's though. okay. You have to sell it. Yes. You have to explain. There's like a customer acquisition cost. Yeah. How much is it costing you to, to educate Edu these customers on this new product? Yeah, a little, little coffee shop downtown Manhattan that is like a boutique that wants to be very high end. They don't. They're, they're okay charging that, but people, people I would be there like, are absolutely. used to paying it. Yep. But people in Idaho, where we're at, they're not used to paying those kind of prices. And so yes. it, it's just different. And, and it depends on your coffee shop. A coffee shop downtown Portland is certainly going to be a lot different than a coffee shop in Idaho. Yes. Because our, our customers want different things. So let's talk about this now. Yes, we're talking about doing your market research. Yes, we're talking about seeing what your competitors are charging okay but there's a very fine line between doing market research and seeing what your competitors are doing and just copying their ever move don't copy please don't copy people Talk to them. it's happened we've been guilty of doing it and then people have been guilty of doing it to us in fact far more the other way <laughs> i mean you're always uh, going to copy like a mocha or a there's milky there's certain things about a coffee shop that every single person is going to offer, right? You should be offering an Americano, a Dopio, a latte, a cappuccino, a white mocha, a regular mocha, a flavored latte, a flavored mocha. Those things are not really coffee worthy things because every coffee shop should be offering at least the basics, right? A drip coffee, a cold brew. Or at least don't coffee someone like directly in your area. Yes. That's even worse. Like, we will never be the first person and only person to come up with the name of a drink. Yes. We have a drink that we call the Vandal, and we have one that we call the Bronco. Because we're in Idaho, and those are our two college mascots for our main universities. Yes. So, I guess, yeah, that's I'm a really sure good other coffee shops have a Vandal mocha. Casey has a really right? good point, like, okay? The recipes themselves are not really unique. They really aren't. Like I have gone to so many coffee shops where they have a white chocolate and dark chocolate mocha. I've heard tuxedo, zebra, black and white. We call ours the Vandal because the U of I has their colors are black and gold. So we called it the Vandal. So look, we all have the same drink, right? But we all came up with our fun and unique names. I mentored a girl in Colorado. We had so much fun coming up with menu names for her drinks. Um, we named some of them the Rockies, the Avalanche. Um, what She lives in this area called Castle Rock, so we named a drink the Castle Rock. And all we were doing was taking recipes that we have at our coffee shop, but just coming up with fun names for her because that makes her shop unique and people love when there's something unique at your shop. So that, I guess, is my way of saying it's okay to copy in the sense that we all are going to offer the same products because there's really only so much we can do right. with these drinks. But it's really cool if you can take the time to say, listen, I understand we all serve a black and white mocha. Why don't we call ours this because it's unique to our area and our customers will find that really cool. For instance, um, Starbucks has their uh, caramel macchiato. Wow brain fart. Caramel Macchiato. Caramel Macchiato is a really unique drink. Ironically, it's a vanilla latte and then they drizzle the caramel sauce on top. So we were trying to come up with fun names. Everyone loves a caramel macchiato. I think it's important to have a drink that's similar to a caramel macchiato at your shop because it's very common in any area of the country. Everyone knows what that is. So we decided to come up with a drink. Um, will ours taste exactly like Starbucks? No way, Jose, because we don't have the same syrup as them. We don't have the same coffee as them. But we came up with our own drink, same recipe. It's a vanilla latte with caramel drizzle. We call ours the F-15 because we live at an Air Force base where we have F-15 jets. All of our Air Force customers who move there look at our menu and they think it is so cool that we have a drink called the F-15. Sometimes they'll order it just because of the name, not because of what the actual drink is. Yeah, yeah, and that's the fun part about it. And I, I feel like I feel like a lot of people just get so stressed and they, I, I don't know, maybe they don't think it's the fun part and that's why they're kind of just looking to like 
copy and paste someone else's or something, but we actually had a good time doing ours. Yeah. And when it comes to recipes and stuff, I mean, this is where it helps if you have experience working at another coffee shop. I mean, she worked at another coffee shop before we opened ours. Yeah. And so she got to, you know, take things from different coffee shops. She's like, well, we made this at this coffee shop. We used a powder, but when we did it at this coffee shop, we used a sauce. Yep. Chocolate powder versus a chocolate sauce. This one, we like the taste of better, so we went with it. Do our customers agree? I think so. Uh, but there but are there's... customers that prefer one yeah. way over the other, and that's what's yeah. so cool, and that's why you have different coffee shops. Like, customers prefer Coke over Pepsi. Does it make one of them right over the other one? No, it just means that everyone has a preference, and that's where the beauty of having multiple coffee shops in the same town come through, because now the question is, and do I want coffee or do I not want coffee? It's, do I want a coffee from them or a coffee from them? And then in that way, we both benefit. Um, there's been fascinating studies about that where you'll put two of the same similar businesses actually right next to each other and it will actually increase business because it gives people an option and they feel more apt to choose one option over choosing just should I get it or should I not yeah so, it's kind of like a kind of like a food truck approach you know you have one food truck on a corner they're not going to be nearly as busy as if there were 10 food trucks on the same corner with them yeah because that helps everyone it's kind of a it's kind of hard you would think more competition would be less business for each food truck but it's not how it works so yeah um it's really it's really there's so much to it guys like but yet there's so little it. to it and that's probably the biggest advice we have is don't yeah don't overthink it like you really don't have to reinvent the wheel however you should make your wheel look really cool and unique compared to all your competition because that's going to make you stand out we recommend graphic designers yep oh my gosh we see like there's 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 a shop it's not a coffee shop it's it's a different business and we go in there and get it's a it's like a they do baked stuff and they have a banner as their menu like a like an outdoor you know those outdoor banners you would attach to like a fence or whatever that's their menu inside their cover it's not a coffee shop it's a like a bakery type business and i'm like i get it for maybe like you know things are tight you're starting your business out. you're just yeah. starting out i mean guys we're going on like year four or five and they still have the same banner and when they change prices they just put a like a piece of duct tape on it and then write the new price it looks absolutely awful that's that's something i wouldn't do I, we always recommend get your menu together and then you know budget the money for a graphic designer to design you a really cool menu they're and, professionals at oh, it too yeah. that's where like you find where you are lacking in skill and then you hire someone to do it better um because they're like Casey said like hiring a graphic designer they not only know things like colors text like what fonts give different like emotions or feelings like it's incredible when you find a great graphic designer um I designed our first menu <laughs> remember we were very poor we were very new I designed our first menu I made a spelling error on it to remember there was an error i know there was an error on yeah, there somewhere i think it was like a capitalization maybe or... something funky happened or i think i put afterburner but then i put afterburner again and it was the same dream i don't know something yeah. happened no one caught it even though i showed it to like five people and we all looked at the same thing um and as soon as we could afford to hire a graphic designer to do our dip menu we did because it needed it so bad and we've it's been fun because we've changed our brand our brand used to be yeah red and white and then it it has slowly changed to like now our logo on our newest location is black. Yeah. You know, we thought but we about still doing still red. have the red and the white and the black. Yeah, we but we've yeah. we've definitely we haven't changed our logo, but we've kind of changed our, our menus definitely changed. We had a, a lot more fun um, I don't know, it's kind of a we'd have to share pictures with it, but it was a lot more fun but a little bit um, harder to find stuff in my opinion than the menu that we have right now, which is more boring yeah. but but very easy and clean. Yeah. So it, it just it, that's kind of the fun part. Like you get you get to make your own choices and changes as as time goes on. And even someone like Starbucks, they don't have it perfected because you can order certain drinks at Starbucks, and if you order it a certain way, 
you're gonna get it for cheaper, but it's the exact same drink. Yeah, and it's that, the wireless thing. And Coffee that is very sucks. confusing in that sense. That's hard when customers do that. Like for example, if someone wants uh, a breve, an iced breve, which is ice, half and half, and then shots of espresso. If they want an iced, uh, like a 16 ounce ice breve, that'd be two shots of espresso, a cup of ice with, with the half and half. Well, what they'll do is they'll order maybe an Americano with light ice, no water, and extra cream. Extra cream. <laughs> so it, yeah. So and you have what, to make sure that then at that point your cream. menu yeah. is set up to have a low, uh, less ice with the extra cream is going to somewhat come out to the same price as the breve, or you just have to read through the lines and realize that They're yes, ordering. I know what you're ordering, but it actually is this, and then you have to train that to all your employees, and it's is a nightmare. Coffee can be very weird in that sense. I've never actually seen, maybe restaurants run into it too, but I've never actually seen another industry where you can manipulate your order and it will change things completely. Yeah, they order it like a la carte, you know? Yeah. Like, it's like ordering a, like a, you know, a signature cheeseburger off a menu and instead you order, I want a plain cheeseburger, but I want to add this, add this, add this, add this. And it's like, sometimes in certain places that might be more expensive, but in our situation, it's like... Figure out how to manipulate it, it's crazy. Yeah, so those are things to keep in mind, I think, with your menu. And you can always change it, but when we say don't overthink it, we really mean, even on pricing, you guys, we've been open for going on eight years, our prices have gone up significantly on everything. Not not our not menu our, prices, our costs our on costs items. On everything. So our, our milk costs have gone up, our syrup costs have gone up, our pretty much everything across the board has gone up. Yes. But our prices on our menus have never changed. We've never changed them. Which is difficult because our customers, are not our customers, I'm sorry, our competition have never changed their prices either. So then are we going to be the weirdos that change ours because our costs went up? Or yeah, they are they waiting for us to do it? Or like what? It's a unique situation really we're in. I don't know like what their prices are anymore. We need to do some research. But we're, yeah, I mean, are we due for a price increase? Yes. Very much so. But, but we're still... <laughs> but then we have to redo our whole menu boards and it's a process. Yeah, and our menu boards are, you know, each menu board you gotta think it's like hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars to do all of them. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, if we're gonna raise the price on everything by five cents, is you that know. worth the thousands of dollars? Yeah, and sometimes it's not worth the trouble because we're like, we're making we're making a good living. Like Yeah, our so, customers are happy. Yeah, so don't overthink it. Don't don't be raising your prices all the time on your on your customers because you know yourself as a customer when you go somewhere. If you go to a restaurant and you love to get this certain pasta and it's usually you know 15, 16 bucks, and the next time you go and it's 18 bucks, and then a year later you go and it's 22 bucks. I mean, that's happened to us, and I'm like, I don't even want to get it anymore. Yeah. Because it's like, my gosh, it's and like, frustrating. within it the last year, the it's gone up like six bucks for the, you know, the whole meal, and so you got to be careful about that, I think, too. Here's my one last: How do I choose my menu? How do I choose my drinks? How do I choose my prices? And the, and that's, I promise you, we will do more videos on this because it mm -hmm. is a process. The menu for us took a very long time to come up with, and it probably will for you as well. Um, my last thing is that once you have kind of decided on prices based off of your market research and you found what the median price for all of these drinks is, once you've done that research, then it's important that you also calculate how much profit you're making on those drinks. And that's the part that takes a long time. So just because all of your competition is charging you know, 350 or whatever for a small mocha, you need to do the research for yourself and figure out, okay, well, our small mocha cost me this much for the cup this much for the lid, this much for two shots of espresso or however much is gonna go in that drink, you're green. Two or this much for milk, this much for syrup, this much for a sleeve on the cup or whatever that's gonna be. You need to calculate out those costs because the thing is that although all of your competition is charging a certain price, you might realize that because you chose the $13 per pound coffee, because you chose the custom printed cups, because you chose this or that or whatever that you're really not making enough money to make it profitable because you have to remember that not only do you need to make okay so let's say let's say that your drink costs three dollars just because i want to make it easy for me in my mind three dollars let's imagine that okay you realize it costs you a dollar to make you're like wow that's really exciting because that means that i just profited two dollars 
but did you really profit $2? Because now you also need to factor in the fact that you need to pay tax, income tax. And a lot of places, or for a lot of people, that's like 30%. So that third of your drink just went away, okay? So of your $3 drink, we had a dollar of cost. Now we have a dollar of tax. Oh, we also have to pay for our internet, our point of sale system, our employees, power, our rent, our power, our all these things. Garbage. And at the end of the day, that other $1 might have just went away. So now, even though you're like, woohoo, I'm killing it. I made $2 on this drink. It really quickly became, I made $0 on this drink. Um, that third, a third, and a third rule is, it's an easy way to look at things. Um, in the photography world, sometimes they say a third for tax, a third for cost, a third for me. So you're really only making one third at the end of the day but you also need to do a third for for things like the cost of it maybe includes tax it, or sorry includes tax your internet your rent all those like fixed costs as well and if you can figure out that okay that cost goes into this then i have some for tax and then the rest of it is mine right that's kind of an easy way to look at how much markup you need to put on your drink and that is why I waited until the end because I don't think that we should dive into that huge can of worms quite yet, but I think that you should start putting it in your mind of, okay, I need to make sure that my costs are reasonable and that I'm not choosing the most expensive of everything unless my prices are gonna be higher to make it worth my time. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that? Yeah, that's that's an overwhelming part because you're gonna try to factor, <laughs> yeah. like if your rent is $1,000 a month, you don't, you don't know how many drinks or how many items you're going to sell. So it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to calculate some of those costs, like your power bill and things like that. But you, when you look at your competition, if the, if the market calls for these certain prices, that's the certain price. Like, I mean, that if yeah. it works for them, it's going to work for you unless your rent is like triple theirs or whatever. Right. So, um, so that's where I guess I just like wanted to quickly touch on, but again, we'll do more videos on this, but quickly touch on the fact that just because your competition is charging a certain price does not mean that that certain price actually does work for you. And you might need to do more research about the location you're choosing or, okay, I really wanted these really fancy printed cups, but realistically we're just starting out and we don't have a lot of capital to start out. Maybe I have to go with a plain cup for a while because mm -hmm. my costs don't support that price. Um, maybe I need to find a different roaster that's a little bit more affordable to start out and then maybe someday if I want to upgrade our coffee and switch to a different roaster that's okay because it's not feasible at the prices that our market is supporting at the moment. So you have a lot of research to do guys but like Casey has said and like I've said don't overthink it and there also is no necessarily right or wrong answer so really just do your research and find what's gonna be best for you and then make sure, just like we did at the end of this video, make sure that those prices and those decisions you're making are supported by a profitable, fair income for you as a business owner and that you're going to be able to sustain a living doing this at those prices. Yeah, I'll touch on one more, one more quick question. Uh, I feel like it won't take a whole lot to discuss is inventory. We get asked a lot, how much inventory do I need to get started? Again, don't overthink it. You know what you'll need to get started on day one. Depending on where your coffee shop is located, how far is it from a grocery store? I mean, if you're like in a mountain town, up, I mean, even mountain towns have grocery stores. So it depends on like what, what you can easily go get. So for us, our syrup and our things like that that's delivered, if we run out of it, we have to come it's, a, it's basically an hour drive one way to go get syrup and things like that if for whatever reason it doesn't show up on our delivery truck or they run out or whatever. So for us, we keep a little more inventory, but there's no magical number because it really doesn't matter. We're not a restaurant. We don't have lettuce and tomatoes and things that are going to expire within a week or, or less. For us, it's like if we buy too much caramel syrup, we just won't order it next week. Because it has an expiration, I think, of like a year or more. So. Yeah, I mean, so like our cups don't expire, our lids don't expire, 
our espresso is not going to expire, right? Like we're using everything within weeks. I would say and the so, hardest one for us to choose what we needed was probably espresso starting out. And I think we started a little low, but our, we were in communication with our roaster and we were like, okay, listen, we really don't know how much we're gonna need because we want our espresso to be really fresh. Um, and Cause you know, coffee that gets too old, it, it affects the taste. And so we were like, but we, we could just drive over yeah. like one hour and they had it ready. So they were yeah. like, hey, if you guys get low, if you guys start going through a bunch, we'll roast some extra and have it here. So they we were didn't like, have Let to- Let us know in the first couple of days, how are things yeah. looking? The first week, how are things looking? We were in constant communication with them so yeah. that we were ready to get more if we needed it. And our roaster taught us a lot about how to pull good shots and things like that. And so a lot of times roasters are very good at preparing coffee. Like if they know how to roast it, they probably know how to prepare it very yeah. well. So if you are, wanting to learn more. I mean, our our roaster was very knowledgeable with La Marzocco espresso machines. Mm -hmm. We love La Marzocco. We can't, I mean, in my opinion. He's the one who got us hooked on La Marzocco, yeah. actually. We've owned, we've owned like eight of these machines and we still own. Not because they're breaking. No, <laughs> no, we still have the original and it works <laughs> we do have just the original. fine. I mean, we, you know, we have, we have one for our house and I mean, these are the greatest machines. Back really to inventory. Are. You got um, this. My finger hurts. <laughs> um, so, I don't know where I was going. Oh, he'll, you know, he taught us though, like how to pull good shots with his espresso and things like that. And so, I don't know, I kind of went back on a backward tangent. I don't yeah. know where I was going with that. You, kinda... you were talking about inventory, you're talking about how much you need. And then somehow, yeah, and then we then got it just like reminded shots. me again that our roaster <laughs> taught us a lot they about did. our espresso. Full anyway, circle. Anyway. Here we are <laughs> we at the end it. of another 46 minute video. Guys, my finger is straight up. And we only asleep. answered like three questions. I, yeah, but that's how, that's why. That's why these videos are They were long. thorough. I think we should do, I think we should do another one soon. I'll go back through and look at some of your guys' other questions. Write them down. Try to really work, work on getting those um, answered for you guys. And um, yeah. We'll figure Hope you guys out. enjoy. Have a great night, guys. Well, I guess it might not be night for you guys. It is for us. We're on a dinner date. We're headed to a dinner date. Yep. And that's why the Rumble Strip Ramblings, got it, are great for us because we do have to drive an hour when we head to the city. And so it's perfect time for us to be in the same place, same time. So yep. we made it. All right, guys. Thank you guys for everything. Thanks again for 10K. This has been incredible. Thank you so much. And your guys' support and your sweet words just mean the world to us. And we really hope you guys are getting a lot of valuable information from this. Um, we love sharing with you. We love being there and hearing your guys' success stories. And the podcast. We're working on it. It is slowly. We painted the wall. We, I don't know how that really helps with the podcast, but we did start there. The equipment will be on the way soon. Stay tuned. It's going to be a few weeks. I think it's going to be a fun journey. But okay. It will be fun. Fingers dead. Bye, guys. Thank you.